Hello, my name is Charlie Lees. I am a consultant gastroenterologist at the Edinburgh IBD unit and professor of gastroenterology at the University of Edinburgh. I'm going to talk to you today about COVID-19 and um, immune suppressants, specifically infliximab and inflammatory bowel disease, but I think this will be broadly applicable for all immune-mediated inflammatory diseases, that's inflammatory bowel disease, inflammatory joint disease, and inflammatory skin disease. It will apply to other patients taking immune suppressants, and this is particularly going to look at vaccination and the results of the Clarity IBD study looking at two doses of vaccine, looking at antibody and serologic responses and decay over time. This is a new talk um, with updated data. Um, here are my disclosures. Um, I particularly want to point out my major funder, which is UK Research and Innovation. This is a patient with Crohn's disease. He is a 45-year-old man. He works as a teacher. He has ileocolonic Crohn's disease. And as we often do, because it is a very effective and usually very well-tolerated therapeutic approach, he has had infliximab and azathioprine in combination. He has well-controlled disease. He has a degree of high blood pressure. He is slightly overweight, but otherwise fit and healthy. He may have had COVID in the very beginning of the pandemic, but at that stage did not have a PCR test. He has a number of key questions, but the one that we are going to focus on today is, will the vaccine work as well because he has Crohn's disease on infliximab and azathioprine? This is an important question. We know in IBD with other vaccines, particularly pneumococcus, influenza, hepatitis B, that the immune response to vaccination is impaired in patients taking anti-TNF therapy with infliximab and adalimab and immune suppressants, azathioprine, mercaptopurine and methotrexate. Tarek Ahmed and his team in Exeter, Nick Kennedy, James Goodhand and Claire Bushi, along with Nick Powell at Imperial, set up the Clarity IBD study to look at what happens to patients treated um, with infliximab over time and their response to infection with SARS-CoV-2 and their response to vaccination. Clarity is an enormous study that involved 92 sites across England, Scotland and Wales, including my site in Edinburgh, the Western General Hospital, where Kate Coville with Loran Derricks and Gareth Jones recruited 245 patients, um, putting us top three of the leaderboard. Most importantly is the UK-wide approach, where over 7,000 patients were recruited in the 10 weeks leading up to Christmas 2020. We recruited two patients on infliximab for every one patient on vedlizumab. Infliximab is an anti-TNF drug commonly used for inflammatory bowel disease, so Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but also inflammatory joint disease. Vedlizumab is a drug we just used for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. It is an anti-integrin antibody that is gut-specific. Both are given intravenously the majority of the time. Both are standardly given with an eight weekly dose in gap. Uh, and people typically come to an infusion suite and continue to do so during the pandemic. Vedlizumab does not impair systemic immune responses, so as to provide an excellent control group for which we could compare the impact of infliximab on our patients. This talk is broken down into two parts. The first, I will summarise briefly the data previously presented on the serological responses to SARS-CoV-2 infection in patients on infliximab. This is important to set the scene between the two groups of patients on infliximab and vedlizumab and to show you that they are broadly comparable. The second part will look at the antibody and also the T-cell responses to vaccination. And we'll look at that after one and two doses. We'll look at the comparisons between antibodies and T-cells. And we'll look at the decay in antibody responses over time. So let's start off. We want to first understand if our patients on infliximab had a similar um, COVID-19 experience to those patients on vedlizumab, so we could compare between the groups. And the answer was yes. They had similar adherence to social distancing measures and similar exposure to COVID-19 cases. We saw no difference between infliximab and vedlizumab in patients who reported symptoms of suspected COVID-19, who tested positive by PCR for SARS-CoV-2, or were hospitalized with confirmed COVID-19. This is reassuring for our patients on infliximab. 
We next looked at the antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 infection. This was using the Roche ELISA against the nuclear capsid. So this shows specifically prior infection. This is separate to the antibody I will show you later for vaccination. Here, split by geography, and bearing in mind this was antibodies in September to December, so mostly shows what happened in the first wave, you can see the highest rates were in the north of England and in London. So we asked next, given that the experiences was the same and the exposure was the same between the groups, did the patients on infliximab have the same levels of antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 or were they lower? And in fact, they were lower. So 3.4% of patients on infliximab had anti-N antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 compared to 6% of patients on vedolizumab. And interestingly, there was an impact further if you were on immune suppressant. So if we just look at infliximab, 3% of those on combination therapy, infliximab plus azathioprine, mecaptopurine or methotrexate, had antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. That was 4% in those on infliximab as monotherapy. And you saw a similar difference if you looked at vedolizumab with and without an immune modulator. So what factors were associated with having anti-N antibodies to SARS-CoV-2? Well, we see non-white ethnicity is associated with having antibodies. We've seen that from many other data sets throughout the pandemic. We saw geography was important. I've shown you that graphically already. We saw that non-adherence to social distancing, as one might expect, showed increased um, anti-N antibodies. And then when we ask what, what factors were not associated with having anti-N antibodies, we saw infliximab, as we saw already, and also an immune modulator. So that's the thiopurines and methotrexate. Flipping this around, we wanted to know what percentage of people who had a proven SARS-CoV-2 infection had then seroconverted to having anti-SARS-CoV-2 anti-N antibodies. And the vedolizumab patients, similar to the background population, 83% of those with a proven infection had seroconverted to having antibodies. Whereas in infliximab, that was down at 48%. And for infliximab plus azathioprine, that was 37%. So to summarize part one, we see that patients on infliximab are no more likely to get COVID, but after COVID infection have reduced antibodies. So we say to our patients, please keep taking your medicines. That's the message throughout. And we ask the question, how does this translate to COVID-19 vaccination? This next section is updated. I've previously presented the data that are published in GUT. That's the paper on the left of your screen now. But this is now updated to include those two um, on a large cohort from Clarity and also the T-cell data. And this is now available as a preprint online I'll put the link to that in the comments below. Um, and this is now under review, under peer review at a, a major journal. So what is the impact of infliximab on the immune response to COVID-19 vaccination? Here we are using a different antibody. So this is the Roche anti-SARS-CoV-2 spike receptor, binder, receptor binding protein or RBD antibody. Here we have measures on 2,000 patients on infliximab and 920 on vedolizumab. Roughly 50% treated um, or given the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and roughly 50% having been given the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine. So first, I'm going to show you the impact of infliximab versus vedolizumab on the antibody responses post one dose of vaccine. This is quite a busy graph, so I'm going to separate this out. But first, I'm just going to explain this blue horizontal line. This is an antibody level of 15 units per ml. And this is the threshold above which you have protective antibody levels against getting SARS-CoV-2 infection and below which you have decreasing protection. So let's look first at patients on infliximab with on the left Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, and in the middle there, Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine. And we can see that after one dose, this black horizontal line that represents the median or the average level, we are below this blue line. 
So after one dose of either vaccine, patients on infliximab did not have protective levels of antibodies. This compares to patients on vedolizumab who had higher levels. So, that, so this black line now in the orange um, charts, which will show vedolizumab throughout, is above the blue line, showing there's a degree of protection against SARS-CoV-2 infection on vedolizumab patients after one dose of vaccine. But what about after two doses of vaccine? These are two dose vaccines. And we see that after two doses of vaccine, patients on infliximab are now very much into the protective region. You can see that that average or that median line, that horizontal black line in these two green um, charts outlined in the blue here are well above the blue line. In fact, the vedolizumab patients are even higher. And when we do the statistics on this, we see there is about a four to five fold reduction in the antibody levels after two doses in the patients on infliximab versus vedolizumab. But nonetheless, infliximab patients after two doses of vaccine in the majority of cases have protective levels of, levels of antibodies. You will see, if you look at these blue graphs, uh, sorry, if you look at these green graphs here, that there are there is a tail, there are some green dots below the blue line. So not everyone has mounted protection, but the vast majority have done so. So what factors are associated with anti-spike RBD antibody concentration? You can see on the top panel for the Pfizer-BioNTech and the bottom panel for the Oxford-AstraZeneca. In both, you can clearly see the impact of um, infliximab. We also see the impact of having Crohn's disease and of being over 60. For Pfizer-BioNTech, we see the impact of thiopurines and methotrexate. Interestingly, that's not borne out with the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, the next really important question was how durable are the anti-spike RBD antibody responses over time in patients on infliximab? So first focus on the top half of this. We're going to look first at the top left-hand quadrant, and this is Pfizer-BioNTech. This is patients having had two doses of vaccine with no prior infection with SARS-CoV-2. As before, you've got an orange line representing vedolizumab, and you've got a green line representing infliximab. You can see that the orange is above the green throughout. So whichever of these we look at, you can see that the levels are higher. The antibody levels are higher with vedolizumab patients than infliximab patients. You see after um, two doses of vaccine that the green line still goes well above um, the seroconversion threshold, which is the blue line. But what we do see is that it then goes diagonally down towards, with decay of antibodies towards the seroconversion line at about 18 weeks with Pfizer-BioNTech. And then if you look at top right panel, which is Oxford-AstraZeneca, you see that at about 14 weeks. There is a very slight decay with the orange, with vedolizumab patients, but this is still well above the seroconversion threshold. Interestingly, the bottom panels show what happens in patients who have had prior SARS-CoV-2 infection, proven by PCR, and then two doses of vaccine. And you can see that after the two doses of vaccine, their levels are high. You can see actually it's already higher after one dose of vaccine. And then the lines are horizontal for both infliximab and vedolizumab afterwards. So there is no um, noticeable decay over time. How does this compare to a healthy population? Well, we've got the addition of a healthy cohort here, a community-based cohort of patients vaccinated. That's represented in the purple here. And you can see that the purple cohort here mirrors almost exactly the green, which is the vedolizumab patients, whereas the infliximab patients here in orange are lower down and show this decay over time, both with Pfizer-BioNTech on the left and with Oxford-AstraZeneca on the right. Okay, so there is decay in antibodies over time with infliximab. We want to next understand how the T-cell responses are affected by infliximab. This is the other major way the immune system develops memory for COVID on the basis of vaccination to provide protection over time. 
So here we're looking at the T cell responses with Oxford AstraZeneca in the left half, the left two columns, and in the right two columns, the Pfizer BioNTech. And you've got infliximab in green, you've got vedlizumab in orange, left, right, left, right. And we've got one dose and two dose of vaccine. So if you look first at the very left, you can see in the green, these are infliximab patients with Oxford AstraZeneca. After one dose of vaccine, they have got good T cell responses. Um, one dose seems to be enough for that. In the right, you can see that that's the same as what we got with vedlizumab. And if you look in the second half, the right-hand half, you can see very similar for Pfizer-BioNTech. Slightly different dynamics of the vaccine. So the T-cell responses after the Pfizer-BioNTech um, are not so high after one dose, but they're very good after two doses. And again, almost identical between the, um, um, the infliximab and vedlizumab treated patients. There are about 20% of people at the bottom here with both drugs, with both vaccines, who don't mount a T-cell response. So we want to know how these two things compare. Um, what do people who have high antibody levels do in terms of their T-cell responses, and what about low levels? So first we can do a simple comparison, and that's what we've got on the right-hand charts here. On the top, you've got Pfizer-BioNTech. On the bottom half, you've got Oxford-AstraZeneca. On the left, you've got first dose. And on the, second, on the right, you've got second dose of vaccine. So on the top, for the Pfizer-BioNTech, you can see that this diagonal black line is going upwards, and that shows a positive correlation. So higher antibody levels are associated positively with higher T-cell responses. Interestingly, with Oxford-AstraZeneca, that's not the case. So this black line here is flat, it's horizontal, and this demonstrates that there is no correlation between T-cell responses and antibody responses here. Perhaps most importantly, we wanted to know whether or not those people with low antibody responses, um, mostly on infliximab, also had low T-cell responses or whether or not they had protection. So what we've done here is we've lined up individual patients from left with low antibody responses to right with highest antibody responses. And we've done that four times. So you can see that after the first dose on the left, for Pfizer-BioNTech, um, for Oxford-AstraZeneca, and then on the right, second dose, uh, Pfizer-BioNTech, second dose, Oxford-AstraZeneca. So on the bottom, you can see these antibody levels going from low on the left, and they go up to the highest on the right. And you can see that on the low, most of these are the infliximab patients, as we've shown you already. But what's important is to then look at the paired chart on the top, which is the T-cell responses, and you can see these don't have that gradient, they're pretty flat throughout. So that means that those people in the left-hand side who have low antibody responses, the majority of them, not everyone, but the vast majority of them have got good T-cell responses. So we can say that antibody responses are lower in patients on infliximab, but the vast majority of these people have good T-cell responses. There is only a very small minority that, that lack both. So to summarize, Patients on infliximab after one dose of vaccine have lower levels of protective antibodies to COVID. Patients on infliximab after two doses of either vaccine have attenuated antibodies four to five fold lower compared to vedolizumab. But they have the same T cell responses as patients on vedolizumab. Patients on infliximab after two doses of vaccine appear to lose protective antibodies within 14 to 18 weeks. But most patients with low antibody responses do have some protection um, with protective T cells present. We will need um, complementary data sets to Clarity to look at vaccine effectiveness in the real world to understand what all of this actually means in terms of breakthrough infections. So a couple of questions then. Firstly, what drugs are affected by this? Um, in our data set, we show that infliximab is affected. We think this is probably a class effect with anti-TNF drugs. So for us, most importantly, that likely means adalimumab patients equally affected. 
We don't know, because we didn't directly study it here, the impact of immune suppressants on their own. We have seen an additive effect of being on azathioprine, mercaptopurine, or methotrexate, to being on infliximab, and to an extent on being on vedolizumab. But we need to study it separately to understand what the impact of that is there. And importantly, this we think isn't just IBD. We think this relates probably also to inflammatory joint uh, and inflammatory skin disease as well as to inflammatory bowel disease. We know that this also is likely to affect other immune suppressants because we've seen that in the transplant literature. If you're taking one of these medicines, please don't be worried. Please keep taking your medicines. Please get vaccinated at the earliest possible opportunity. After one dose of vaccine, we think you should continue to socially distance. After the second dose, you have protection, but that does look like it decays, at least in terms of antibody responses. And so we think this makes a strong case for a booster dose in these patients. We do desperately want to know what this means for people on thiopurines and methotrexate by themselves, also ustekinumab, tofacitinib um, as well. And so we are doing a follow-on study called the VIP study that Nick Powell is leading. Recruitment is well underway to this in London, Exeter, Cambridge, and now also in Edinburgh. So if you're on any of these medicines or medical combinations, um, and had your second dose of vaccine in May or June, you'll still be eligible. So please go to vipstudy.uk um, or at vipstudy1 on uh, Twitter um, and fill in uh, the form to get in touch. So let me summarize um, with a bit of data that I haven't shown but have um, shown you before. The major COVID-19 risk in IBD patients is ascribed to age, comorbidity, active disease, and corticosteroids. Other medical therapies, and that includes anti-TNF drugs, do not appear to impart risk. That is very important and a clear, reassuring message. So to IBD teams and gastroenterologists, please continue and proactively treat IBD and encourage our patients' adherence to prevent the disease from flaring. We strongly endorse vac vaccination for IBD patients, regardless of therapy, um, and this is clearly borne out in guidelines from the International Organization for IBD, from the BSG and other major organizations. Either vaccine, you need to get both shots and you probably also need to get a booster. Um, and please continue to follow public health rules and guidance wherever you are located. Appreciate that the situation is different across the world with people at different stages of vaccination. I hope this is helpful to colleagues and friends um, and to our patient population. We will continue to do everything we can to provide the information, keep you up to date, being completely transparent um, to help keep you safe. Um, thank you for listening. I'll be back with more details as and when they become available. Thank you. Goodbye.